What's going on guys? Welcome back to this video. Today we're going to do dynamic analysis and reverse engineering of the Mamuna ransomware. I call this ransomware the silent ransomware because it doesn't communicate. It doesn't talk. As you will see in the analysis in this video, this ransomware, once it, once it hits or infects the victim PC, it doesn't do anything other than encrypting the files and dropping the ransomware node. Usually ransomwares communicate with a C2 server. It's a server that is under the control of the attacker to send commands and to exfiltrate data from the victim PC. This ransomware doesn't have any C2 server. It does have, but it doesn't talk to this C2 server, meaning it doesn't receive any commands from the attacker server and it does not exfiltrate any data from the victim PC to the attacker's PC. Meaning that if the uh, if you are infected or if you know someone who is infected with the Mamuna ransomware, in order to decrypt their files, they need to communicate directly with the website declared in the ransomware node and speak with the attacker to retrieve the um, uh, decryption key. This ransomware was uh, observed in 2024 and uh, it's a very simple ransomware in design. It's not complex. It doesn't use any encryp complex encryption algorithms, making it very simple to use by uh, those who want to, those who don't have technical knowledge and want to send this to the to, the, to, the, to the, any victim, right? So. Mamuna can be found in the dark web and it's sold there. Anyone can acquire an access to the interface, as you will see. And today we're going to perform dynamic analysis and reverse engineering to understand the full extent of this ransomware. Let's get started. Now we take a look at the interface used to create or to customize the Mamuna ransomware. Now, this interface is sold to everyone who wants to buy the ransomware and everyone who plans to send it to victims. So basically, um, here we can see options such as customizing the operating system, Linux, Windows, and here we can see how to customize the uh, ransomware to target the Windows operating system. For example, you can select the option to chat with the uh, victim. And we see other options here such as self-deleting the ransomware after uh, it infects the uh, victim's PC, deleting event logs, killing processes, printing the node, encrypting file names. All these options can be checked and here we can see the node can be customized to fit the uh, purposes of the uh, operator. So that's the builder section here. And here we can see the files that can be uploaded to the victim machine. And here we can see target section where it displays the list of the targets the ransomware that the ransomware successfully infected. So when we first run the analysis, uh, we see the executable in the desktop. Okay. Now the first thing you want to do is to execute this file but basically as you can see on the left on the right pane we see the process the main process of the ransomware being executed now look at the desktop files all the files on the desktop they look unrecognized so basically because the extension has changed from the original extension to haes and we see the wallpaper now has been changed and now we see, read the statement your files have been encrypted click readme to read the note so this is the ransomware note and we see links to tor sites because they end with dot onion and we see the threat as you may have noticed by now all of your files were encrypted and stolen we have stolen a significant amount of your important files from your network and stored them on our servers additionally all files are encrypted making them inaccessible without our decryption tool so this suggests that the ransomware communicates with the c2 server to deliver the <coughs> uh, decrypted form or the original form of the files and if the victim does not comply with the uh, ransomware note the ransom note their files will be leaked and as you can see uh, they will be locked away forever that's the ransomware note if you take a look at the process tree here we see um, after the ransomware executes uh, we see another child process of the ransomware which is cmd if you click on this we see a couple of commands executed by the ransomware. Click on more info. And then we click on this to bring up the full command. And we see CMD followed by ping 127.00.7. This is a loopback IP address. Usually it is one, usually it ends with one, but basically this time it ends with seven as a form of obfuscation. Dash N3. So basically this command. It is a ping command to the loopback IP address. So what's the point of this command? It's instead of using uh, sleep, sleep APIs or uh, timers to delay the process execution, 
it uses a ping to the loopback IP address. And that's to bypass any monitoring uh, software or maybe protection on the uh, machine it is running on. And then we have delete slash F slash Q. So it is deleting the executable from the machine to actually prevent any forensic traces. Now, if we click on the Raspberry process and then on more info, uh, we start first with the behavior activities that are categorized as other. So we see here these actions uh, sum up to reconnaissance activity. So basically, uh, the ransomware starts by gathering information such as the supported language, the computer name, information about the registry, and the machine UID from the registry. Also, it creates files or folders in the user directory. Basically, it is the ransomware node. If you click on this, we can have, we can see the uh, files that are created. We can see the readme haes.txt, which is the ransomware node. It is created in more than one directory, increasing the chances the user sees uh, the node. So you see here the ransomware node created in the uh, up data directory, but we saw it earlier in the desktop. And then we have creates files in the system's root, the drive root. This is also the uh, ransomware node. And we see the actions or the behavior activities categorized as malicious. So all these activities are categorized as belonging to uh, the Mamuna ransomware. Among these behavior activities, we see the actual encryption process, renames files like ransomware. Click on this. <clears throat> we can see here the uh, original file and how it has changed into the encrypted form. So the original file here, an example is rentalscup.rtf. Uh, it is located on the in the desktop. Now, after the encryption process, it has been renamed and now the new extension is H-A-A-E-S. -E we see this in multiple files as well. So look, all these files now are changed and a new extension is added, H-A-E-S. -E now, if we take a look at the connections tab, we would like to inspect the connections the ransomware makes and see what are the C2 server IP addresses because we want to inspect the IP address um, maybe uh, conduct a threat intelligence, extract insights. So let's have a look at the processes here. So the process name is listed in this column. And we want to highlight the process of the ransomware. We can see the process name here on the right pane. And we will search for this process here. So if we scroll down, we can see the process of the ransomware here. And we see connections to uh, using port 80, suggesting a web browsing activity, but the IP address that connects to it looks internal IP address. So maybe this is a uh, a way to hide or to obfuscate the fact that the malware or the ransomware does not perform any network communication. This is just to uh, maybe uh, distract the analyst. If you scroll down, we see if there are other processes. So from here, we can see that the ransomware does not connect to any C2 server. If we click on the DNS requests tab, scrolling down to see if there are any strange domains. They all look legit and recognized. Clicking on HTTP requests and we search for the process. And again, we do not see any indication that the ransomware process conducting any network activity or connection to any C2 server. That's why I call this the silent ransomware. It does not communicate with any C2 server. It does all the encryption all the uh, work on the local machine. So basically when the ransom, if we go back to the ransomware node, you see the ransomware claims that it, it, it actually exfiltrates the data of the victim's machine, but that's not correct. We didn't see any indication that the ransomware communicates with a network or the, with a C2 server. So basically it does encrypt all the files locally and this is it. If you want to decrypt the files, you will have either to work a decryptor yourself or maybe to uh, pay the ransomware through the chat and they will give you the decryption key uh, maybe through the chat support. We see the chat support in the Onion sites administered by the uh, ransomware developers. Then we will want to extract the indicators of compromise. So we click on the IOC here and we see the hashes of the sample. SHA256 and scrolling down, we can see the hashes of the other samples as well like the uh, dropped files and the files that were encrypted. Now, we, you do not need them for the analysis for the report. You just need the uh, hash of the original sample. And of course, 
if there are URLs, IP addresses, domains, we should also include them in the final report. But in the case of this silent ransomware, we do not have any IP or URL to report. And there is also the uh, links mentioned in the notes file. Do not forget them. Now, if you do some reversing with Ghidra, you see here I search for the main function, and this is the main function. But my main objective here is to locate the encryption routine or the function that's responsible for uh, encrypting the uh, victim's files. So quickly, what I did, I would go to the search and click on program text. And for me, I write encrypt, select program database, select all fields and search all. And as you can see, we have a lot of hits. Okay, so going through this, we can see we have this added drive C to the encryption list. If you click on this and we locate this, you can see the push instruction. Okay, and here it is adding a drive for the encryption. You can also take a look at more hits by clicking on others. For example, we have um, got no path encrypting all drive. Now, if you click on this, we see the function. That's the main function responsible for encrypting the uh, victim's drive. Okay, now scrolling down, we will not analyze the function fully. We will just uh, touch on the uh, uh, lines where it encrypts the files and folders of the victim. You can go back to the search and we see here file node for encryption. We saw this starting encryption in panic mode, found drives to encrypt, and we see the responsible line here. That's the line starting encryption in panic mode. If we focus now more on this routine, this is where the encryption starts. Okay, and as you can see, first we have the variable local 143c. Okay, and that's basically the variable responsible for the delay. We saw earlier uh, in the Enron analysis that the ransomware performs a ping or a virtual ping to a loopback address, okay, to perform some delay before the encryption. That's the variable responsible for the delay here. Okay, and then we have this function. This is the function actually performing the delay for maybe a number of seconds, milliseconds, we're not sure yet. And this is not important for this analysis because we know that this is a ransomware and it performs an encryption. Now, if we scroll down, we have encrypting in panic mode. And that's basically, it's up to the operator. Now, when the operator performs or creates the ransomware, they choose to run it in panic mode, non-panic mode, or maybe a custom mode. So in panic mode, we have 100% encryption of every file. And here we have a partial mode here. The partial mode uh, performs the encryption with a criteria on the size of the file. It's a partial encryption. Okay, now we have uh, these variables. Okay, if we scroll down, and this is controlled by the if statement here. The if, the else if, and the else. That's how uh, the ransomware operates. So basically first it uses the panic mode, full encryption, and, and we have the else if here to encrypt each file using the function, uh, this function. And we have an else as well here to keep the original flag. Scrolling down, we have get tick count and we have get native system information. Basically here, get tick count 64, grab a timestamp and get this native system info to, uh, to perform enumeration or reconnaissance on the system information. And then it performs the multi-threaded encryption loop we see here. So it starts here. That's the main routine responsible for the encryption. And this is controlled by the if statement here. The if, the else if, and the else. That's how uh, the ransomware operates. So basically first it uses the panic mode, full encryption. And, and we have the else if here to encrypt each file using the function, uh, this function. And we have an else as well here to keep the original flag. Scrolling down, we have get tick count and we have get native system information. Basically here, get tick count 64, grab a timestamp and get this native system info to, uh, to perform enumeration or reconnaissance on the system information. And then it performs the multi-threaded encryption loop we see here. So it starts here. That's the main routine responsible for the encryption. Now, if we take a look here at the, this line where it says local encryption completed, and double click on this, we see this function, another function here named, uh, ends with uh, 13. 
and this function performs a bunch of variable declaration. We're not going to go through this, but there is uh, an important line to understand here, which is this line. So here we have the code checks a byte at ebb uh, zero x12. It's hexadecimal value, okay? And basically, here, if this value is equal, or this, if this value equals to zero, the function will enter local drive encryption. It's going to encrypt all the drives. Okay, if it is not equal to zero, it's going to perform custom path encryption. Key takeaway here from this if statement is that the function performs encryption in two modes or in two branches. The first branch, full local drive encryption and custom path encryption. And that's controlled by the value of this variable. If it is equal to zero or not, and based on the result, it's going to do either, of the, either one of these branches. And then we see a couple of API calls to retrieve information about the drives. In order to encrypt them, we have get logical drives strings. And we have get drive type. Also, we have get file attributes. All of this to encrypt the files and directories in, of course, the full local drive encryption. After it's done, it prints local encryption completed. And then we have the other loop here, starts from here, where it performs custom or custom path encryption. And after it finishes, we got, or it prints all custom paths processed. And that's, uh, of course, dependent on the choice of the person who created the ransomware, or let me say the affiliate. As we uh, show earlier, the affiliate can choose custom path encryption or full local drive encryption right from the interface. Okay, and then there's a cleanup and some wrap up on the code. So that's the main, uh, actual, that's the main function responsible for, it's actually the central driver routine of the ransomware encryption engine. We saw that we've got two modes, local drive and custom path. In the local drive, it enumerates the logical uh, drive path, and on the custom path, it, encrypt, it encrypts the only user-specified files or directories. And um, basically, after the custom path is processed, we have uh, some uh, optional uh, encryption of the network shares, and then it has a cleanup and wrap up routine. At the end, before we wrap up, remember that SOC teams, or as a SOC team, you can start using Anyrun by signing up an account. So you can sign up an account for all your team, all your SOC team, or maybe uh, sign up an individual account if you want to try it out, fill in your name, the business email of, the, of your company, the password, accept the reviews, and then start using uh, Anyrun. Good luck.